Well, welcome back. We're going to continue with our presentation on the family and dealing with children from the ages of birth through eight to ten years of age. Setting the foundation for their destiny in this early time of training and education. A child is not born with a, a new heart. They, they must be taught and trained uh, in these early years as to what is right. And we have learned thus far that the conscience is what speaks to us of what is right. And so we have the Spirit of God who we pray and ask to come and to teach us, but we have a part to play as well. We must be laborers, co-laborers with God in not only giving the gospel to others, but most importantly of educating ourselves and our children if we are parents. And if you're going to be a parent someday, if the Lord doesn't return before that time, there is a preparation, a responsibility that you have to know what your responsibility will be when you do have children. So we were at the point where we were looking at the character quality humility. Humility. Some, uh, it's the root of all virtues. And we are told that we are to add diligently to our faith in 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us to add diligently to our faith, the first thing is virtue. And humility is the root of all virtues, and that is something diligently we want to add to our faith. Uh, I admonish you to read chapter 1 of Second Peter, because that is the true ladder of success that we are to climb daily. And that is a part of our education, adding diligently to our faith. So parents generally have not taken a proper course with their children. They are not restrained as they should be. They are left to indulge in pride. That means doing what they want, what their will is, and follow their own inclinations. Anciently, parental authority was regarded and children were in subjection to their parents. They feared and reverenced them, but the order in these last days is reversed. Some parents are in subjection to their children. They fear their children and yield to them. They fear to cross the will of their children. But just as long as children are under the roof of their parents, dependent upon them, they should be subject to them. Parents should move with decision requiring the following out of their views of right. And so we have humility versus pride that needs to be taught. The divine plan intelligent discipline. The greatest suffering has come upon the human family because parents have departed from the divine plan to follow their own imaginings and imperfectly developed ideas. Many parents follow impulse. They forget that the present and future good of their children requires intelligent discipline. We're told that the best illustration we have of true education is Jesus training the 12 disciples. That is the best illustration that we have been given and that I also ad admonish you to study out. The very methods that Jesus used in that three and a half years of training the disciples. Many parents follow impulse. They forget that the present good of their children requires intelligent discipline. Parents do their children great wrong when they allow them, we uh, have gone over this already, to allow them to scream and cry. They should not be allowed to be careless and boisterous. 
If these objectionable traits of character are not checked in their early years, they will take them with them strengthened and developed into the religious and business life. Children will be just as happy if they are taught to be quiet in the home. The home is a sanctuary. We are to have wise rules and regulations. Fathers and mothers, be sensible. Teach your children that they must be subordinate to law. Do not allow them to think that because they are children, it is their privilege to make all the noise they wish to in the house. Wise rules and regulations must be made and enforced that the beauty of the home life may not be spoiled. Our children are to be educated line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. That's found in the book of Isaiah. That is true education. God speaks to us a little here, a little there, precept upon precept, line upon line. From babyhood, the character of the child is to be molded and fashioned in accordance with the divine plan. You know, we can go over this material and over this material, but not see it. Not see and not hear what the Spirit's trying to tell us. It's trying to tell us that there is a divine plan to education. And it wasn't until I had my own children uh, about 30 years ago that I decided, not decided, but that I found that God had a plan. I was following, I was a sheep following, but as I began to learn more about true education, I saw that I was following the wrong plan. And as long as we follow the wrong plan, we will only maybe look like a Christian, have the form of godliness, but have no power. The power is to be used in having victory, victory over sin. Power then uh, comes right along with when we're preaching, when we're teaching, when we're giving the gospel. The power is the in that I live the gospel. That's what made Jesus so powerful in his ministry. And even still with Jesus, the King of Kings, the Messiah, he was here, but he didn't look like what the people thought the Messiah would look like. And so he was rejected. But praise God, his illustration by his life planted seeds in the hearts of the people so that when the Holy Spirit fell after the resurrection, ten days after they, uh, the disciples coming to meet together to clear things away so that the Holy Spirit no longer would have walls up to barricade the Holy Spirit from them, that's when there was thousand uh, brought to a knowledge of the truth in a day. And we're going to see that again. The truth, the gospel truth planted in the hearts of people, but they're being held back. It might be a spouse. It might be a parent. It might be a pastor. But we're told that these truths will spring up in the heart, especially if you're praying for the Holy Spirit. And we're told that there will come a time when nothing will stop you from obeying the truth. And so praise God that we have another opportunity to plant the gospel seeds so that the Holy Spirit can water them. And at the, the time appointed, uh, they will spring up. But we have a choice to make in applying it to the life and, and pleading for the Holy Spirit to help us. If this is the truth, help me to apply it to my life. And so we did go over this and there, here we have a mother uh, duck of some kind with um, their babies, families, families. God set us up in families and the mother in the human family is the best teacher and nature the best lessons, lesson books. And then personal religion, our children, especially around the age of 8, 10, and 12 years of age, they can have their own personal religious experience and have a conversion. We're to seek the Lord early, we're shown, and here another family. Uh, of a hen and her babies. 
illustrating for us what God wants for us in the family. And here we have two young children being taught about the Ark of the Covenant. And in the chest of that Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments. And <clears throat> this is what uh, we want to teach our children to love and to obey. And in youth, suffer the little children to come unto me, Jesus said, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. So the little child is an illustration for us of the kingdom of heaven. Not its disposition, though, to disobey and be wild, but its disposition to be a learner, to be a pupil, to sit at the feet of mother and father and learn. And you may be struggling with that, especially the very small children. They have to be trained to sit quietly during worship and sit quietly uh, during uh, the church services and so forth. But aside from that, we're told that from birth to 8 to 10, they should be as free as lambs, running and skipping and being happy and enjoying learning from nature to develop that physical constitution. So a little child should not have to sit all the time. That's not a healthy uh, child. But a child can also be taught useful work. And so uh, children are not here just to live to themselves and to have their own pleasure and amusements and uh, recreation, but to learn to work. Uh, because we, we all have a mission here, and it is to learn to reflect the character of God and help the lost, help those that are perishing. And many of us who believe in Christ may be perishing in many areas if we are ignorant, if we are lacking in knowledge. I know for myself I was lacking in the area of health and I had to learn the laws of health, obey them so that I could have health. But once you've lost your health, you will never actually be where you could have been. So. It's best if we don't break the laws, whether it be health or any other laws, uh, because there is um, a weakness that comes upon the body. So parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or 10 years of age. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them the great book of nature. So very early on, the parents can direct the children's minds to what is going on in nature and they can be observant and learn much scientific information there. Mother should find time to cultivate in herself and her, in her children a love for the beautiful buds and opening flowers. And we went over this as well, the variety of form and so forth. And then we spoke a little bit about the eagle and how it teaches us responsibility. Responsibility, knowing and doing what is expected of me. And using the will in uh, making sure that we are being responsible by keeping our promises. I will, make, I will not make excuses. I will do my work to the best of my ability. I will make things right when I do wrong. I will know my duty and will do my duty. The Bible is full of our duty. And because we neglect the Bible and neglect finding out what our duty is, uh, will be the same as though um, we knew our duty and didn't do it. So neglect is not the answer. Uh, we're to find out what our duty is and to do it, and that will clothe us in responsibility. The only schoolroom for children from 8 to 10 years of age should be in the open air. This is a beautiful experience, being out in the open air, even though it may be warm. Uh, it is wonderful, especially for children. They need that. Um, and the flowers that have been added here is a real plus. The opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery. The opening flowers reminds us of Eden. And God loves the beautiful. 
And so by beholding that which is beautiful, we too will be changed into a beautiful character. And that's why mothers, fathers, but especially mothers at home with the children all throughout the day need to have a beautiful countenance, a happy, cheerful countenance, because our children will be a reflection of our countenance. And uh, there's a lot of instruction for mothers about what their duty is in order to have their children grow up with that beautiful character. Child's only textbook should be the treasures of nature. That is not meaning that the scriptures are not a part of their textbook. Their main textbook is the Bible, the scriptures. But because children can't read yet, they can hear though, you can tell them the stories, you can read from the Word of God, but they need the pictures in this early time, birth to 8 to 10 years of age. They need the pictures. That's why we're told, come out of the city, because the city is full of people crammed together and man's uh, works. But children need to have God's works, his creative works to behold and to learn from. And this is what we're told. And their only textbook should be the treasures of nature. So parents are to learn how to um, use nature as the illustrated book of God's Word. And so we have the sunlight material that has been uh, written to teach you, to give you a pattern of how to do that. We do not have hard copies of those books except for the lesson that you have that we're using for our worship in the morning and worship in the evening. But there are uh, PDF files that we want to share with you as well and I believe they're going to be made available so that you can put them on a, pr uh, a computer and print them out for the children. They're basically a children's activity book and a parent book. And then for the small child birth to three years old, there's another book. But that will last for a quarter and then you print another book. So overall in the three year series you will have 12 books for the teacher, 12 books for the children. And then you repeat it. So what the child could not do in the children's activity at a particular age, the next time you go through it, they'll be older, they'll have more abilities, and they'll be able to uh, answer the questions and so forth. And the main thing that a child is learning from birth to 10, 8 to 10 years of age is God's laws written in nature his laws writ written in the Word of God and character and then bringing it into the life. So see you're training a child not just to know what the scriptures say, not just to know even in nature what it's like, but they will actually see in nature the laws lived out. So when you learn the laws in the scriptures you will be able to see those laws from many different angles because you'll know about creation. And uh, you parents who did not learn this way will be being re-educated by educating your children. This is God's system of education of you as a teacher. And it was God's plan for the children of Israel coming out of Egypt to learn by teaching their children in the family. This is the three angels message, how it can be lived out in the life. And as it's lived out in the life, you will be giving the three angels messages from your family, living out the gospel. Beautiful plan. It is so beautiful, so valuable what God is sharing with you here uh, while we're here and not only from us but you will have the material accessible free of course it'll maybe it'll cost to print it but you have access to it so you can use it either on the computer with children though they need hard copy they need to be able to not be looking at the computer until they're a little older and uh, focusing on the printed page but up until eight years of age they don't even need to be concerned about their ABC's 
And I'll go over a little bit of that today with you, how to teach them uh, phonics. And uh, that starts at the age of eight. So you don't even have to teach them how to write or how to read until eight years of age. If they do learn, which children are eager to learn m the majority of the time, and so many children may learn even on their own by the age of eight without you teaching them, just reading to them and they may be following along, they might be able to read, but it would be sight reading. And sight reading isn't as effective and uh, efficient and best for their long-term reading abilities as is phonetics, learning the sounds that the letters make. And this is, we're speaking about English. So, nature being the only textbook that plus the scriptures is w the only thing that the children need other than useful learning useful work in the home learning how to manage a home um, until the age of eight and then you teach them how to read all right the only textbook nature these lessons imprinted upon the minds of the young children are uh, what is needed amid the pleasant, attractive scenes of nature will not be soon forgotten. And today, because of the fault system of education, we have a lot of people that forget. Oh yeah, I forgot. Because they have so much information coming in, the brain actually zones out and they don't get what they're being shown or taught. But when they're taught God's way, then their memories are more alert, their memories are better, and what you then are saying to them, they see, oh, that's important, and they're going to remember it. Um, I have been um, taught uh, some about teaching teachers how to teach uh, by a teacher, and um, he was saying that the majority of people, it takes about anywhere from 30 to 40 times of hearing something before you actually learn it. And it's just little bits of information at a time that makes it easy also to remember. So if we don't use these methods of teaching, then you're not going to remember as easily. There are few people that when you tell them one time, they'll remember. Of course, if you're giving simple instructions, then that should be okay. But if you're giving uh, a lecture on something or you're studying uh, a particular item, if you keep the amount of information down to about between seven and 10 at the most things or principles, then it's easier to remember uh, that many than say 15, 20, and so forth. So keeping it, like the book of Isaiah says, a little here, a little there, precept upon precept, line upon line, is the best way to learn. So health, happiness, and vivacity. In order for children and youth to have health, happiness, and vivacity, and well-developed muscle and brain, they should be much in the open air and have well-regulated employment and amusement. So uh, that is something that we want to look at as well, amusement. Uh, the word uh, muse, uh, we have museum. So in a museum, it's usually things that are of historical value uh, or <coughs> uh, biological. It might be a museum of birds or a museum of animals of all kinds. So true amusement is going out in nature, like I took a little walk before this lecture, and I was searching for shells and rocks and I found some really unique uh, green, they're a type of green, turquoise rock that just struck my eye and so I kept picking those up and that was amusing to me, amusement, uh, because I was learning about uh, a rock that I don't have or is not uh, something that I have seen where I'm from and so 
Um, that's the type of amusement we're talking about children can have and re well-regulated employment. That means they need to have a schedule so that they know what to look forward to throughout the day. That their meal time is going to be on time, regular. That their exercise time is going to be regular. That their rest time, their um, their employment in the home, uh, if they're sweeping or helping with the uh, the lunch or preparing the meals, things like that. They need to be able to see uh, what their day is going to look like. So well regulated employment. This is how we have health. This is how we have happiness and uh, be vivacious. The first eight or ten years, children should not be long confined within doors, within the home uh, environment. Remember the model school, the model home and school was what? The garden. Yes, so much activity happening in the garden. And that's where children need to be. Nor should they be required to apply themselves closely to study until a good foundation. Are we building a house? Yes, the body is a temple for God. So we need a good physical foundation th that's been laid. And in these first birth to eight to 10 years of age, outdoors, building strong muscles and strong bodies. That's their uh, main uh, job. Also, to get more of this information in the sunlight material, the 10 principles of true education, you want to read that book. It's kind of a study uh, from both the Desire of Ages and the book Education. And so you could, when you go to the Book of Education and look through the uh, table of contents, you'll see a similar table of contents, but it's a more um, uh, modern, you might say, uh, a study done today to teach you how to uh, put these principles into practice and also to bring in some scientific information that backs up what God is showing us. And even if science did not back it up yet, uh, we are still to do what God says to do because he's the creator. And so science is only true science if it matches up with God's word. The first eight to 10 years. For the first eight or 10 years of a child's life, the field or garden is the best schoolroom, the mother the best teacher, and nature the best lesson book. Even when the child is old enough to attend school, his health should be regarded as of greater importance than a knowledge of books. And he should be surrounded with the conditions most favorable to both physical and mental growth. So the child, uh, if you are in charge, which you are, all parents are responsible for their children. When you learn what true education is, and the child is now of school age, what is school age according to God? In other words, outside of the home? Eight to 10 to 12 years of age. But then, if you do send your child away from home, you want to, because you're still responsible for your child's character, you want to be sure that that education system is lined up with God's education system. And like we have been shown, uh, both Jesus and John the Baptist could not go to the schools of their day because it would have unfit them for their mission. So you, once again, parents are responsible for the mission also of teaching the child what their mission is according to what God has shown you and ha is leading you and keep that child on track as to the mission that God has for the child. Even when a ch the child is old enough to attend school, his health should be regarded as of greater importance than a knowledge of books. He should be surrounded with the conditions most favorable to both physical and mental growth. It is customary to send very young children to school. They are required to study from books things that tax their young minds. This course is not wise. A nervous child should not be overtaxed in any direction. So there's a parable about the 10 virgins. Five are wise, 
and five are foolish. So whenever we're shown uh, what a wise course is versus a foolish course, if we're on the course that fools take, then we're going to end up being a foolish virgin. But if we're on a course that is considered wise, then we will be wise. So we want wisdom in these last days. Physical training, the first six or seven years. And here we have two elephants. I have in my bag over here, let's see, this is the bag that has something in it that is what this color tells us. What does this color, what's the message that this color gives? Loyalty. Why? Pardon? Royal blue. What was royal blue? The Ten Commandments were written on sapphire stone. Sapphire stone. The Israelites had a blue ribbon around the hem of their garments and I believe the hem of their sleeves. And that w represented to those around them when they saw that blue ribbon that this was a special people. A special people. And what made that people special was the obedience to God's Ten Commandments. You ask a Jewish person today what made them so special, they probably don't know the more nominal Jew. Uh, because they're, a Jewish person is a Jew by um, nationality or culture, um, but not necessarily are they even a believer in God. And so some are atheists. But <clears throat> what makes God's people special, and especially the Jews, and why they're some of the smartest. Uh, we have musicians, we have businessmen that are Jews. Uh, be why are they so talented and special even today? It's because they were obedient to God's law. And by doing what's right, following the law, not just the Ten Commandments, Ten is the number of completion. So it's a summary. It summarizes the laws that govern everything. So by studying the things that God has made, we'll uh, show you what is right versus what is wrong. Now, especially we need the scriptures right along with nature to be able to see that. But I'm going to have, if we have a brave soul, someone who has some courage to come up and see what is in our blue bag. And you can show it. If someone wants to come up or we will just um, not see what's in that bag if no one wants to come up and show us. But it has something to do with the blue message that is given and it is it shows that character quality of loyalty and um, obedience. Don't have anyone that wants to come up? Oh, good, good. Physical training. What is it? Oh, an elephant. Does an elephant demonstrate obedience? It does. They're some of the most obedient creatures. And you can pass that around so the children especially can handle it and see it. The uh, elephant teaches us obedience. And uh, they're used in many places to carry heavy loads and to, they're real workers. They're very obedient. And here we have on the screen two babies um, kind of pushing each other around, uh, playing together. Elephants are wonderful to study and to learn from, especially for children. And all of us are children in many ways. God is telling us that we need to pay some special attention here. During the first six or seven years of a child's life, special attention should be given to its physical training rather than the intellect. So today we have parents that are teaching their babies how to read. And everybody gets so excited. Yes, thank you for putting that back. 
But here, God is telling us that that's not the time to teach a child how to read or to develop their intellect in that way, reading. They need, as we are shown here, to be reading God's handwriting, the ABCs in nature. And that's why agriculture is the ABCs of education. Because agriculture is outside, it's working in the garden, they're learning about nature, they're learning about the soil. The soil represents what? The heart. Soil represents the heart. So if you know how to build the soil, take any kind of soil and you put the right ingredients together, you'll have the type of soil that can take special types of seeds because not all seeds grow in the same type of soil. And that shows you too, not all of us are going to grow, let's say, from my presentations, but you might grow a little bit better from my daughters or Lydia LaJules or someone else that you're, um, you're hearing. Or you might learn a little bit from me and a little bit from someone else. And that's God's plan because we all have different soil ingredients, you might say, in the heart to actually allow the seeds of truth that are being planted there God may need to work on your soil before that seed actually germinates and um, produces fruit. So soil and working in the garden, the ABCs, we're teaching the children that different kinds of plants need different kinds of soil to grow and to flourish. I'm amazed at, because there's so much sand here, that you can just plant some of these plants and they're going to grow and do well. Why do you think a coconut tree, why does a coconut tree grow so well in this sandy soil? Where are the roots? They go down deep. When you put water in this soil, it just goes and goes and goes and goes because it's sandy. And so the date palm, the reason we're told to be like the palm tree is because the roots go so deep. And if you want to stand in a deserty place, a hot place, a sandy soil, um, a place, let's say, where there aren't a lot of Christians, where it just is really hot, it's dry, it's, uh, it's a, it seems to be a hard place to grow. You've got to sink your roots down deep. You've got to know God's Word and be able to read His nature because you may not always have access to His Word. So whatever word you can plant here, all those seeds, those promises, and then you can grow well in a place where it's dry, it's hot, sandy soil because you've got deep roots. God is telling us, be like the palm tree. Not just the palm tree because there are other trees that have other characteristics that we need to be like. Where I'm from in Alabama, we have a lot of evergreen trees. You don't have many evergreen trees here, although the palm tree is an evergreen tree. But we have pine trees that have needles. And those needles can remind us of the narrow way because pine needles are narrow aren't they yes and the deciduous tree or the broadleaf tree that loses its leaves in, when the cold weather comes can remind us of the broad way the broad way but the narrow way is always green always has faith always have faith, but the, the road is narrow. And we're told to be like the evergreen tree. Evergreen. Ever faithful. No matter what the conditions are. If it's cold. When the winters are, there's winds and cold and rain, that evergreen tree stays green. Faithful. Hopeful. Full of faith, hope, and love. All right. <clears throat> Learning from Nature, God's first book, his illustrated book 
of his word. He spoke, right? He spoke and it was so. So the things that God has made, first he, he thought it through, he planned it. That's what happens in the heart. And then he spoke and it was so. So the word came and then um, his creation. All right, so six to seven years of a child's life, pay special attention to their, what kind of training? Is it the intellect? Physical. physical training. After this period, if the physical constitution is good, then the education of both should receive attention. So then it's okay to be working more closely in the area of academics. But some children are a little slower than others, so if we educate every child the same way, mass education, some are going to lose their way. Some are going to be pushed when they're not ready physically, mentally, they're not ready. And so we have many, many people who uh, don't even want to learn because they have been trained uh, wrongly. They haven't really had special attention like God is wanting to give. Infancy extends to what age? Six or seven years. So we have some small children, one-year-old, two-year-old here, and we think of them as infants. But six, seven years old still as infants? That's what God says. We need to treat them in a very special, tender way. And we need to understand what kind of training they need. Up to this period, children should be left like little lambs, unless you're raising goats, kids, to roam around the house and in the yards in the buoyancy of their spirits, skipping and jumping free from care and trouble. Up to ages six, or seven. It doesn't mean that you don't teach them to be helpers and teach them to be useful. But remember, we want to have it all balanced out. Don't keep them within doors all the time. Don't have them sitting all the time, but have them useful and um, uh, especially useful. And here it says, and let them roam around the house. They're, they're learning. And you, mothers, they're teaching them. It's so wonderful to see children that are alert to the needs in the home because that's what they're being trained um, to be alert to. Parents, especially mothers, should be the only teachers of such infant minds. That's what we're talking about here, what God is talking about, infant minds. They should not educate from books. What are the books the children should be learning from? Nature, that's right. Oh, how they love that. Parents, especially mothers, should be the only teachers of such infant minds. They should not educate from books. And just a few more slides. Actually, this is the last one for this PowerPoint, and we're going to get into some other things. The children generally will be inquisitive to learn from the things of nature. They will ask questions in regard to things they see and hear. And parents should improve the opportunity to instruct and patiently answer those little inquiries. They can, in this manner, get the advantage of the enemy and fortify the minds of their children by sowing good seed in their hearts, leaving no room for the bad to take root. All right, this is the end of the slides, and then we're going to get into... Um, something else. The mother's loving instruction at a tender age is what is needed by children in the formation of character. All right. I have something to um, show you before we get into the language, but could I have a child and a, the parent come up? So we want to try this apron on. This is an apron like you've probably never seen before. Who would like to put this on? We need the child and the parent. Can you want to raise your hand if you want to volunteer? Grandma will do, yes. Come on up.
<laughs> All right, Grandma, maybe you could tie the waist. <laughs> Sister Carla wanted to put this on the uh, ladies today who were making up their uh, recipes, and I said, oh, no, <laughs> we didn't want to get any food on it, although I'm sure it could be washed. This is a, an apron that can help you and uh, your children uh, learn about the body parts. Let's come up a little closer so those over here can see. Uh, maybe let's go over on this side. Yes. All right, Grandma, you can come over. Grandmother, you can come over here too because you might be able to help. Um, <clears throat> let's see if we can identify some of these parts. We did a very good job with the uh, felts. Um, let's start with, uh, why don't you, grandmother, pick one sh and hold it up. You just, what you do is you just take it right off. You can just rip it right off and see if there's anybody that knows what that is. What do you think that is? Esophagus. What is that? Esophagus. Esophagus? Well, doesn't the esophagus go all the way to the stomach? Yes. But what do you think this is? They're close together. You have the esophagus, and then what else do you have? The, what? What goes to the lungs? Goes to the lungs. The tra no, trachea. 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 There you go, the windpipe. The trachea. So when you swallow, there's a little epiglottis there, a little door that it either opens up and then goes down into the esophagus, or you take a breath, and then it goes you know, to the lungs, through the trachea. So there we go, the trachea. Okay, what's that? Yes, so how many lungs do you have? Two. Two, that's right, two. A right and a left one. Okay, what is that? Stomach. Stomach, Stomach. Stomach uh-huh. And it tells right what it is. And it's got the shape there, so they can take it off and put it back on. Okay, let's take another one. Oh, look at that. That's a long one. That's a long one. What is it? Large intestine. That's right. And there is um, an instruction sheet, so it tells you more about each of these uh, organs and what they do. Okay, what else? I think you forgot the most important thing. Oh, the most important. The heart. Does it open up? Yes, it opens up. And how many chambers in the heart? Four. Four. What's the difference between a human heart and a frog's heart? Number of chambers. Number of chambers. That's right. How many, do you know how many are in a frog's heart? I'm guessing two. I think three. And does our heart, a human heart, does it clean the blood? Does it, you know, it, the blood comes from going, circulating through the body and then it goes into the heart and then to the lungs to get the um, oxygen. So what kind of blood do we have? Do we have clean blood or dirty blood? Coming in is good blood, going out is dirty blood. And what is, what is going to make it dependent? What's it dependent on it making it clean or dirty? Oxygen. Oxygen and also what you eat. The nutrients that you take in or the junk that you take in. Is that going to make a difference in what kind of blood you have? Of course. It, yes, of course. Of course. So God is looking for a body temple that's clean, that has clean blood circulating through it. Perfect circulation means perfect health. Perfect circulation means perfect health. So if you're eating lots of fat, lots of grease and things like that, that's getting your blood dirty. Well, a frog, which in Revelation it talks about coming out of the beast and the dragon and the false prophet are frogs coming out of its mouth. Frogs, false doctrine, but also when you look at a frog's heart that only has three chambers, it doesn't get its blood clean. 
it continues to have dirty blood circulating through its veins. And to me, that represents the false doctrines and the errors also represents dirty blood because Jesus' blood was pure. It was pure, and that's why he had the life and the health that he had. God is looking for us, yes, to have pure doctrines and no error, and yet, at the same time, he wants us to be eating right so that our blood remains clean and pure. All right, what else do you have? What, what is that, and how many do you have that are like that? How many of you ate beans today? Yeah, kidney beans. Kidney beans, yeah. Kidney beans look like and can remind us of the kidneys. The kidneys, and you have two. If you eat too much protein, your kidneys get sick. So if you need to understand these nutritional facts to keep your body organs um, working properly and keep them healthy. Is it uh, possible to eat too many beans? It is possible to eat too many beans. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. When is that? <laughs> when uh, I know that when I changed my diet, I was told to eat beans and greens. So I ate a lot of beans. I ate beans every day. Well, for me, it got to the place where it was too much. It, too much, you can tell it in your kidneys, aching, things like that. Um, so, but I was eating it beans for the purpose of keeping, holding my blood sugar up because it's full of fiber and protein. And through the years, as I have kept the laws of health and my body now is more regular, I don't need beans every day. Um, you do need the grains and I find you have to learn your body, know your body um, and the physical activity that you do, how much of each of these things that you need to stay healthy. But you can eat too many beans. You, what you want to eat a lot of are those fruits and vegetables at different times. And then, yeah, your proteins a little bit. Okay, anything else that you've missed? Okay, what is that tube? Looks, looks like some plumbing. Swallow. That's the esophagus. That's right. When you swallow or you chew your food and you swallow it, it goes down that tube and then into the stomach and out of the stomach and finally um, into the intestines where it's digested and it goes into the, the body. So it looks like we got just about everything. Except this long one. Well, yes, and we got this one. And let's see, this one is the liver. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I don't see the pancreas and the gallbladder, which may not have. Okay, let's do this one. Let's have one of the children maybe come and take the one end and see how far it goes. Yes, you want to come? Oh, Jasper, come on. Come on, Jasper. Let's see if we can find the end. Okay, here's the end. You have a long, 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 long tube. I think it's about like 22 feet or something in here. Your intestines, long intestines. And that right there shows that we, one of the things that shows that we are to be vegetarians because it takes about three to four hours to go through that, that digestive system. Um, but in a meat eater, they have a very short intestine, so that meat is chewed up, eaten, and then it goes out of the body quickly. But well, we have a very long intestine. That's our small intestine. Look at that. Wow. Wow, that's long. long intestine? Yeah, well. Yeah, we ha would have to measure that. I'm not sure. I'd have to look on the instructions here if it's the actual size of our intestines. Um, but it's t it's to point out the fact that we have a long one. And if we eat meat, what happens is it gets in there and it spoils and rots. 
and uh, we were never intended to eat meat. In uh, Genesis it says if you eat the meat, drain the blood, and then it's going to shorten your life. So meat eaters have a shorter lifespan and they, um, they get sick and diseased um, easier than we do. All right. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. The intestines. So we can make learning anatomy and physiology fun. We can make it amusing. We can uh, make it interesting for a child and even adults who may not know can learn right along with their children. It's very exciting. Health is one of the most wonderful learning experiences. Thank you so much for your help. This is the anatomy apron. All right. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time on um, language for you. We have special paper for writing, and those of you children who are eight and above um, you can practice writing on this paper. It's special paper. It's not just paper that you get at a store uh, for teaching children how to write. Um, it's uh, been um, studied that this, you could each person, each family could take one and then make copies of it uh, so that you have this particular size. Um, this is the reading program, plus there's two or three notebooks of information on teaching reading uh, by phonics, but I find that this is the simplest way. This is a sound tape. This is put out by the Riggs Institute. It's a sound tape. So it, you can hear the actual sounds that each letter makes. So this is teaching reading by phonetics or phonics. So these are called phonograms, phonograms. And um, before you even, did you? She wants to know whether she did by. Right, afterwards I can uh, give you that information so you can look it up. <laughs> so here you have, this is what you show uh, a child. Um, before they don't even have to know the name of the letter because you want them to know more than anything the sound that this symbol makes sounds like ah uh, or ah uh. it it also makes the sound a ah uh, and aw uh. and these are some of the words for like at ah uh. Tape, so A. Want, so A. Uh. And talk, so A. Uh. A W sound. So it's a short A, A. Uh. A long A, A. A H sound, A. Uh. And A W sound, A. Uh. Like want, want. So you go over the sounds, they see it. And then you can also, by the age of eight years old, some later, my daughter was 12 uh, before she was reading well, and she just, it, she had a difficult time with phonics. And so um, not all children will, but you have to know your child and do the very best to help them to see this is important to learn how to read by learning the sounds and the rules. So there's a lot of information on this back side about this sound that A makes. And so you'll go through maybe two or three letters and see how they do if they're, if they're getting confused, if they're not learning very quickly, then you just keep it real simple and go through it throughout the week and then bring in another one. So then they learn also what the name of that letter is. But it's not important to start this type of learning until the age of eight to 10 years of age. And some, it even takes longer. So writing and reading are um, more easily learned. It's not that they can't learn earlier, but we're finding out it's best. So true common sense comes from knowing what God says is best. Co our conscience is about what is right, and so these early years teach and train the child as to what is right, 
and how to use common sense. God says this is best. This is the way we're going to do it. And it doesn't matter about the heart's desire when a child is not converted yet. A child may not like what you're doing, how you're teaching them. That's not about it. We want a new heart. David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So God is wanting us, especially as parents, to understand his ways, and then we can train up our children in the way they should go. We've been told also that to train a child is not just about getting up and giving a lecture. To train a, a child is to touch their palate. And today you had some recipes demonstrated and then you were able to taste them. Some may be new tastes and flavors to you. Um, but God says, taste and see that I'm good. And it's so wonderful to see, to taste and see that God is good and he does want the best for us and um, he wants us to be the leaders like the Jews were to be and in many ways they are so talented but because of keeping those Ten Commandments and learning to keep the principles of all the academics in every area of life we will become the head once again and not the tail we must copy God we must be followers of him and his divine plan and not followers of those uh, around us that are following man all right what we're going to do next is we're going to take a break and then my daughter Kimberly is going to share with you the next part of the curriculum what to do with your nine-year-old nine to say 15 uh, what to do with them what kind of books to use we're going to go over how to use some of the sunlight curriculum for that age group so that you can see if you do have children that age or um, if you have the younger children and you God is leading you to continue to educate them in ho at home when they reach the age of nine uh, you can start another program which will be academics from the Bible how to teach those academics from the Bible though they will have a health book they'll have a math book music book They'll have a history, geography, and prophecy book. They'll have a language book, and they'll have a speech book. And for each of the lessons, it will use the same pattern as for the younger children uh, by leading the mind to the Bible. How do you teach Bible? I mean, math from the Bible? How do you teach music from the Bible? How do you teach all these academics from the Bible? That'll be the next lecture in about 10 minutes. So get up, take a break, we'll have a word of prayer, and uh, come back and we'll go over uh, some principles of using that curriculum. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, thank you so much for being here, for uh, giving us attentive ears, for helping us to focus, especially the individual families, helping them to focus on what you want them to know now. You know their needs, and you're the one who can lead them uh, through your Holy Spirit to just what they should do, the next step that they should take in their lives. Thank you for being the master teacher in our lives, and we can depend on you and trust you that you will lead into all truth. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right.